Hi, welcome to Father Games. Today, we're looking at the 2-5 player game, Nidavellir. The Dwarven Kingdom was at peace for millennia, but no longer. The arch enemy of the Dwarves, the Dragon Fafnir, has returned, and an army must be constructed to defeat him. In Nidavellir, you're trying to construct this army, but only the bravest of armies will be chosen. Do you have what it takes, or will you cower in fear at the great might of the dragon? Let's look at how to play. Inside the box, you'll find five kingdom map boards, three gem trade markers, five basic and one special gem, 60 cardboard coins with a royal treasure platform, three tavern signs, 21 hero cards, five royal offering cards, five distinction cards, 87 dwarf cards split into two ages, four card holders, and a score pad. To set up the game, each player, or Elveland as they're referred to in the rulebook, receives a kingdom map board and one of each of the basic coins, returning any leftovers to the box, which you'll only have if playing with less than five players. Next, players receive their starting gems. For a two-player game, only the five and four valley gems are used, and as player count increases, you'll add the next highest available gem to the game. So for the four-player game that I'm setting up here, the five, four, three, and two valley gems would be used. The gems are then dealt out randomly to each player and placed at the top of each player's board. After that, add all the gold coins to the treasury, matching the number on the coin with the correct slot. For a two or three player game, remove two seven point, nine point, and eleven point coins as indicated on the treasury and return them to the box. They will only be used for a four or five player game. When that's done, organize the cards by their backs. There are four different types of cards, age one cards, age two cards, hero cards, and distinction cards. The hero and distinction cards can be added to the card trays and put in reach of all players as shown. And for the age one and age two cards, if playing with less than five players, remove any cards from these decks that have the five symbol at the bottom of the cards and return them to the box. And finally, place the three tavern signs out in ascending order and be sure to leave a space in between each tavern for a row of cards. After the taverns are placed, you need to add dwarves into those taverns that players will be trying to recruit. From the age one deck, deal out three cards at each tavern if playing with just two players, Otherwise, deal out one card per player at each tavern. So our four player game will be set up like this. Once cards are placed, put the gem trade markers under each set of cards as a reminder. Now I'll go over what these do a little later, but for now the setup is complete and we can move on to gameplay. Nita Valir is played over as many rounds as there are cards in the decks. It changes depending on the player count. How it works is each player puts a coin of their choice face down on top of each of the three tavern symbols on their board. And the remaining two coins will be placed at the bottom of their board here to make up what's called their pouch. The three symbols on each player's board match the symbols for each tavern in play. And, you guessed it, the coin placed by each player is used to bid on a dwarf card in the matching tavern. Starting with the Laughing Goblin Tavern, all players flip their coins on top of the Laughing Goblin simultaneously and whoever had the largest value coin gets first pick of the dwarf of their choice from that tavern. The chosen dwarf is placed beside that player's board, and the next player with the second highest coin chooses a dwarf and so on, until all dwarves in that tavern have been recruited. In the case of a two-player game, the remaining dwarf is discarded and he leaves sad and unwanted. After that, players reveal the coins from the Dancing Dragon Tavern, and if you haven't guessed the pattern by now, the player with the highest coin chooses a dwarf from the Dancing Dragon first, and the player with the second highest coin chooses a dwarf, and then the next highest, until all dwarves have been chosen. Again, the third card for a two-player game is discarded. After that, players do the same thing with the Shining Horse Tavern, until all available dwarves have been recruited, or potentially discarded in the case of the extras in a two-player game. When the dwarves from all three taverns have been recruited, then new cards are drawn out to the taverns again, and again, until the age one deck is depleted. After that, players compare who had the most of each type of card in their army, and are awarded distinctions based on that. But we'll get to those a little later. After that, the age 2 cards are dealt out the same way the age 1 cards were, and players will be bidding on these cards next. And when the age 2 deck is depleted, the game is over. And honestly, that's the end of in a nutshell. But you may ask, Luke, don't all players start the game with the same 5 coins? Surely players must play the same value coins as each other from time to time? Well, that's a great question. That happens all the time. Remember those different number gems that each player had at the top of their board? Great. Well, when players tie for the coins they placed on a tavern, whoever has the highest number gem gets first pick between them, 
and before the coins are revealed for the next tavern, the players who tied swap gems. So if there's a tie at the next tavern, the same player won't win the tie again. These gem trade markers are placed under each tavern as a reminder that gems between tying players must be swapped before moving on to the next tavern. Now, if three players tie with the same numbered coin, you can pair gems like we just saw with the highest value gem choosing first, but when exchanging gems, the highest value and lowest value gems are traded between players and the medium value gem remains with the same player. If there's a four-way tie, the highest gem and the lowest gem are swapped, and the two middle value gems are swapped with each other. And finally, on the very unlikely chance that five players tie with the same coin value, then the highest and lowest switch gems with each other, and the next highest and lowest switch gems with each other after that, leaving the player with the three value gem who has no one left to swap with. Now you may be wondering why there's a treasury full of coins, and how players can get those coins. Well, let's go over that now. Each player has a zero value coin, which at first glance may not seem like it's worth much, but I'm here to tell you that, well, it's not. It's a zero value coin. Whoever plays it gets last pick at a tavern. But there's a catch. On the coin, you may have noticed this symbol. After a player reveals a zero, they reveal the two coins they had in their pouch, add those numbers together, and take a coin from the treasury of equal value. The new coin will replace the coin of higher value they had in their pouch. For example, if you revealed a zero coin, and your pouch had a 5 and a 3 value coin in it, then you would take an 8 value coin from the treasury and remove your higher value coin, the 5. The 8 point coin will be used next round, potentially giving you an advantage against your opponents. Red coins are put back to the box when removed, but if you already had an upgraded coin in your pouch, then when it's replaced, it goes back to the treasury. Now going back to the same example, if we needed the 8 value coin from the treasury, and there was no 8 value coin left, well, then we would take the next highest available coin, in this case, the 9. If there was no higher available coin, then the next lowest value coin would be chosen instead. Now that's how the treasury works, and now you probably see why it's so rare that 5 players would ever tie with the same value coin. Now let's briefly take a look at what the dwarf cards do, and how they can score you bravery points. There's 5 types of basic dwarves in Nidalvalir, separated by different colors, and they all score you points a little differently. The blue dwarves are the explorers, they're the most basic dwarves. They score you a number of bravery points, as listed in their rank. Next we have the green hunter cards. When chosen, they are placed beside your board, and while there's no numerical value on the card, the arrow in the rank will point to how many points you'll score at the end of the game. The more you have, the more points you'll score. For example, if you finish the game with two green hunters, you score four points. That sucks. If you finish the game with six, you score 36 points. That's a whole lot better. Alternatively, you can multiply the number of dwarves by itself to get the same result, but it's just easier to line up the ranks to your player board. Next we have the purple blacksmiths. When chosen, they are placed beside the green hunters and score points in an identical way, again matching the arrows in the rank to the value on your board, only this time you'll use the numbers from the purple row instead of the green row. For example, 6 will score you 33 points at the end of the game. Next we have the red warrior cards. To score bravery points with them, add up the numbers as shown in their rank, and also the player who ends the game with the most ranks adds their highest value coin to their score as well, so it can really pay off to have the most of these. And finally we have the orange miner cards, and these can really ramp up the more and more you get of these. To score points with the miners, add up the value in all the ranks, and multiply that by the number of minor ranks you have. Don't worry, we'll look at an example. If I ended the game with this, I would add up the value in all the ranks, which would give me 6. And then I would count how many minor ranks I have, which is 8. Then I would multiply those numbers together, giving me 48 points. And finally, while not a dwarf card, another card you'll come across in the taverns is the royal offering cards. They simply let you add the value on the card to any of your coins. The coin can be flipped or unflipped, but when the new coin is placed, it's put back the same way the old one was. Every time you have one of each type of rank in your army, you have created what's called a rank line. You immediately get to choose one of the heroes from the supply. The neutral heroes, or the ones with no color, are placed on the unused side of your army, while the other heroes are placed in the line that matches their color, potentially creating another full rank line, in which case a second hero could be recruited. Now I'll go over a quick breakdown of what each hero does at the end of this video, but for those who aren't interested, I'll quickly go over what the distinctions do and how scoring works now. After all the cards in the first age are depleted, players immediately compare their cards for distinctions. What's happening here is the king is performing a troop evaluation and handing out distinctions to each player that has a majority of each type of rank, but only the best of each army is chosen. In the case of a tie, then no player is awarded that distinction. And remember, you're comparing the number of ranks, not the number that's in the rank or the number of cards. 
Whoever has the most warrior ranks achieves the King's Hand distinction and they get to add 5 immediately to one of their coins. Whoever has the most green ranks achieves the Hunting Master distinction and upgrades their zero value coin to the special three value coin. On future turns, when this coin is revealed, that player still swaps coins in their pouch, but they won't necessarily get the last choice at which dwarf to choose because it's not a zero coin anymore. The distinction for the most miners is the crown jeweler distinction. It awards that player with the special value gem. This gem can never be traded when players tie for coins. In the case of a tie, this player is excluded and any remaining players who tied swap their gems instead. The value in this gem is 6, so that player will also win any future ties, and that player will also score 3 points at the end of the game as indicated by this marker on the gem. For the majority of blacksmiths, the King's Great Armor distinction is awarded. That player who achieved it adds the special blacksmith to their army and gains a new hero if any new rank lines were completed by this card being added to their army. And finally, the distinction for most explorers is the Pioneer of the Kingdom distinction. It allows the player who achieved it to look at the top 3 cards from the H2 deck and add one of those cards to their army. If no one wins this distinction, then the top card of the H2 deck is discarded instead. All awarded distinctions are placed in each player's command zone. Now pretend I ended the game with this army. Not bad, right? Lining up the ranks of the Green Hunters to my player board would score me 9 points. My Purple Blacksmiths would score me 12 points by lining them up to my player board. Adding my blue explorers together would score me 24 points, and for the orange miners I have 9 ranks, and adding up the value in all the ranks would give me 12. Multiply those two numbers together and the miners would score me 108 points. Adding the values of the warriors together would give me 34 points, and assuming I had the most warrior ranks, my highest value coin, the 23, would be added to my score as well, giving me 57 points for the warriors. Next I would add all my coin values to my score, giving me 60 more points. And finally, I would add the 3 points from the special gem to my score as well. Add that all together, and assuming my math is correct, then my final score would be 273 points. If this was the highest bravery score, then I'd win the game. In the case of a tie, then any players who tied for first, tie the game, and get to face the dragon together. So that's how you play Nidavellir. I'm going to quickly go over what each hero does now, but for those who aren't interested, thanks for making it this far, and enjoy the rest of your day. The Dwarg Brothers feed up each other's bravery and score you a number of points based on how many of them you end the game with. While tough to do, getting all 5 can grant you some serious bravery points. 135 points to be exact. Ska the Unfathomable adds 17 points to your bravery score. Astrid gives you a bravery value equal to your highest value coin, so 23 points in this case. Grid the Mercantile adds 7 to your final bravery value at the end of the game and immediately adds 7 to any of your coins except the 0. Crowl the Vanal adds 7 to your final bravery score and adds 2 warrior ranks. Terra Lethal Strike adds 14 to your final bravery value and adds 1 warrior rank. Dig to the Explosive adds 3 ranks to your hunters. But when played you must burn the last dwarf from 2 other columns in your army. But keep in mind that you only recruit a new hero if you have more rank lines than heroes. So if this line was completed again, a new hero would not be recruited because it would already be an equal number of rank lines to heroes currently recruited. Agar Fist of Steel adds 2 ranks to the Purple Blacksmiths. Bond for the Tyrannical adds 3 ranks to the Purple Blacksmiths, but again he requires cards to be burnt from other rows, in this case only one other card would be discarded. Zoral the Foreman adds 3 ranks to the Orange Miners, and 1 to the value of all minor ranks. Lock their Greedy Heart adds 1 rank to the Orange Miners and 3 to the value of all minor ranks. Horia the Elusive adds 20 to the Explorer's Bravery value, but she can only be recruited if you already have at least 5 other Explorers in your army. Idun the Furtive adds 7 to your Explorer's Bravery value and 2 Bravery points to each Explorer rank in your army including herself. So in other words she's worth 9 points and all other Explorers are worth 2 more than the number listed in the ranks. Now the last three heroes are not recommended to be used until players are familiar with the game. Thread the Headhunter can be placed in any army column despite her being a neutral colored hero. No card may be placed on top of her and if a card would be, it is placed underneath her instead and at that point you can switch Thread to any other army column. When distinctions are being handed out, Thread counts as a rank of whatever army she is currently present in and at the end of the second age, Thread is placed in that player's command zone and scores that player 13 bravery points. Love the Unpredictable is a wild card, and just like Thread, she can be placed in any army column. If she's recruited in age 1, put her in your command zone right up until distinctions are being awarded. 
She counts as one rank towards any distinction of the army she's placed in and may trigger a new hero when placed. If she's recruited in age 2, then again she's put in your command zone, but this time before counting up bravery points, she's put in the army column of your choice. Depending on what army she ends the game in, she counts as either one rank for the hunters or the blacksmiths, one 11 point rank for the explorers, one 7 point rank for the warriors, or one 1 point rank for the miners. And finally we have Yulene the Seer, and she is definitely a unique hero. She is placed in that player's command zone when chosen, and will score that player 9 bravery points at the end of the game. When placed, she also lets that player immediately pick up any unflipped coins from the board, and they will get to choose which coins to put at each tavern after they see what all other players have bid. And this effect will last the rest of the game, so all future taverns this player will bid after the other players have revealed their coins, which is a huge advantage. If that player reveals a zero coin, then they choose any two coins from their hand to add up for the upgraded coin. The newly acquired coin will still replace the higher of the chosen two coins, but goes back to that player's hand, and can be used at a future tavern that round. And that's how you play Native Valyria. If I missed anything, or you have any questions, leave a comment below. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and stay tuned for more videos.